All right. Good afternoon, and thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Eileen Quigley, and I am the founding executive director of the Clean Energy Transition Institute. Our mission is to accelerate an equitable clean energy transition in the four Northwest states. We provide neutral data and analytics to guide decision-making by key stakeholders, such as all of you gathered here today, to engage in fact based deliberations about how to decarbonize the Northwest as equitably and rapidly as the climate crisis requires us to. We focus on the unique energy and political characteristics in this far left corner of the United States in the context of the 11 Western states. We use crisp communications to demystify the complexities of decarbonization. Before we get started and we hear from Evolved Energy Research, I want to acknowledge several people without whom we wouldn't be here today. So let's start with Liz Thomas. There she is, um, CETI board member, vice president, treasurer, Liz Thomas, and the incredible k &L Gates team um, who can't hear this, but Liz will pass on to them. This is the third event that CETI has been fortunate enough to host here, and I cannot say enough about what a dream it is to work with the k &L crew. Uh, CETI's other board members are here as well. President of the board, John McGarry, back there. Kathleen Hebert, over there. Ross, in the front. And Bonnie, Bonnie Fry Hempel. CETI is exceptionally fortunate to have these clean energy leaders guiding our strategy, and I am the most fortunate of all as I am overseen by them. We have three of our advisory council members in the house today too, Nancy Hirsch, Elizabeth Wilmot, Michael Lazarus, as well as two of our technical review committee members, including our board members who advise the CETI and involve team so ably from last August through early January, Glenn Blackman, right there. And I don't know if I've seen Poppy yet, but Poppy Storm will be here. Uh, she's founder and director of the Institute for 20, of the 2050 Institute. And we've been partnering with Poppy for several years on building decarbonization and developing our scale 2030 project. And as a side note, Brad Lilliquist and Elizabeth Wilmot and I and if he could have made it today, David Fujimoto partnered with Poppy decades ago in the city of Issaquah. We have several funders in the room today who make CETI's work possible and who supported this project. All CETI donors have blue dots on their name tags. I particularly want to acknowledge Kim Wright and Karen Laughlin. And I know I saw Kim come in. Okay, I haven't seen Karen yet. Of the Salty Family Foundation. The SFF provided the seed funding to launch CETI back in 2018, and their generous support has made our work possible the past five years. I also deeply thank Greg Small, ED at Climate Solutions, for agreeing to fiscally sponsor CETI at the outset. Without that, and the help of the incredible Connor Sharp and Shannon Sedgwick, CETI would not be here today. Finally, a huge shout out to my small but mighty team, Ben Hagen, in the back there, Ruby Moore Bloom, and our summer intern, Kate MacArthur, whose first day is today. <laughs> you have Ben to thank for the delicious hors d'oeuvres and beverages of your choice that you'll enjoy after the presentation. And one logistical note before we get started later on during the Q&A, we will have a handheld mic, which Ruby has, yes, um, for you to use. Please wait until the mic gets to you so your question can be heard in the room and picked up by the recording that we hope we are making of this briefing. We will find out at the end. CETI released the first ever regional decarbonization pathway study with Evolved Energy Research almost exactly four years ago on June 19, 2021. The analysis gained significantly more traction than we had anticipated it would at the time. And it led to our being able to put in a competitive bid that we won to provide the technical and economic analysis for the Washington 2021 State Energy Strategy, an effort that we worked on with many talented Washington State Agency staff and several who are in this room today, in particular, Michael Furs, who I haven't seen yet, but uh, Nancy Hirsch, Glenn Blackman, Poppy, and Michael Lazarus. Our work with Evolved caught the eye of Montana Governor Steve Bullock, 
who requested our team provide analytics to support the Montana Climate Solutions Plan that Governor Bullock released in September of 2020. Following years, CETI and Evolve provided the analytics to inform clean energy policies during the Oregon 2021 state legislature, which helped lead to Oregon passing HB 2021, the 100% clean electricity bill, which requires certain electricity providers to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 100% below baseline by 2040. When Princeton University released the Net Zero America project in October of 2021, for which Evolved has also provided the modeling, the CET board and I immediately knew we wanted something similar for the region we serve. We had actually taken some heat from modeling an 80% below 1990 emission levels by 2050 targets in our first deep decarbonization study because it wasn't aggressive enough. And while we had modeled Washington's ambitious net zero emissions target in subsequent analyses, we had not applied a stringent net zero goal to the rest of the region. Furthermore, significant policies had passed all across the 11 Western states, the region that evolved models. And we knew that those policies would have major impact on results. At the time, we had no way of knowing that the Inflation Reduction Act would pass on August 16, 2022. We were fortunate that it took us until that month to amass the significant funds required to run this study, as it meant Evolved could include the IRA incentives in the model. As you will learn, those incentives have produced significantly different pathway results than we have seen in the past. The Net Zero Northwest study is the country's first regional deep decarbonization pathway study producing with a net zero target, and it is Evolved's most ambitious project to date which is saying something because Evolved has been the cutting edge of decarbonization modeling throughout the United States and Europe since the team left E3 and created the company in early 2016. I've had the pleasure of working with Jeremy Hargreaves with all of our CETI decarbonization studies, and he's known to many in this room as well for his brilliance, his patience with answering questions, and to say nothing of his lovely Scottish brogue. Jeremy holds a Doctor of Philosophy in Energy Optimization, and a master's degree in environmental management and economics, both from the Johns Hopkins University, as well as a master's in chemical engineering from Imperial College in London. Katie Pickrell joined the Evolve team this year and has brought significant analytical firepower to our work, deep experience in utilities from her time at Pacific Gas and Electric, and strong communication skills. Katie holds an MBA from the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley, and a BS in Materials Science and Engineering from Stanford University. Last week, the world experienced the hottest day, week, and month on record. Scientists think, in fact, that this may have been the hottest weather our planet has seen in 125,000 years. We have absolutely no time left to begin to bend the emission curves down steeply. I will turn the mic over now to Jeremy, and he's gonna lead us through the Net Zero Northwest key themes and findings and explain how our region, due to our relatively clean grid, is poised to lead in developing clean fuels to decarbonize the hardest sectors. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that wonderful introduction, Eileen. Uh, so what I would like to leave you with today is some of the key themes from the study um, that we've spent the last basically year uh, doing. It's a really comprehensive study. So a lot of the stuff that you'll see here is just scratching the surface. Um, you can go to the website that we've set up for this and dive deep on any one of the topics that we're covering today. Uh, but these are kind of the greatest hits or highlights. And I want to uh, take you through um, some of these today. So what the, the study was designed to answer was a few key research questions. And we came up with these uh, from the work that we did in the uh, Washington State Energy Strategy and as, as well as follow on discussions with people in this room and people in the region. Um, and they kind of filled in the blanks for some of the things that we still had some uncertainty around as well as the world changing over time. You know, we have IRA incentives, things have changed in the technology world, um, and we're better, better able to model some of the dynamics in the system. And so 
uh, we could we could look in more depth and with more richness at some of the um, the strategies for getting to net zero in the future. So these questions included what resources must be built to meet clean energy demand for different energy sectors in the Northwest by 2030 and 2050. So that's kind of the bread and butter. That's what we looked at in past studies as well. And that's the refresh in this study. What is our investment strategy going forward? Um, what is the impact of accelerated or constrained transmission expansion across the Western grid? So transmission was one of those areas that we still had a lot of uncertainty around coming out of the, the previous studies. We wanted to focus on it more um, because it's one of the biggest drivers about what you do and where. Um, and so we've, we've looked at that in more depth here. How does decarbonizing gas compare with electrification as a decarbonization strategy in buildings? So comparing electrification against retaining gas in pipelines, what are the outcomes for costs and for investment strategy in the region? What role can decarbonized or distributed energy resources play in a decarbonization strategy? Uh, what are the trade-offs between clean fuels, including biofuels and synthetic fuels and hydrogen? Again, an area that uh, we wanted to explore further and also one that has changed probably the most out of any aspect of, of uh, getting to net zero since the previous studies that we've done, given the incredible incentives that are coming out of IRA uh, for hydrogen and for uh, CO2 capture. Um, what, are the, what is the impact of the pace of transportation electrification on the overall cost of decarbonization for the Northwest? So indicating how, how much we should push on decarbonization or, of our transportation sector. And then what is the impact on health metrics in the Northwest if decarbonization reduces criteria pollutants? So we know that it's a benefit to be reducing emissions from power and from tailpipes, but we wanted to quantify how much of a benefit that was. Um, our approach to this is going to be familiar to most people here that, are, that have looked at the Washington State Energy Strategy. We developed a common set of assumptions, and that was informed by a technical review committee as well, about uh, what we should be assuming in all of our scenarios. So what are the kind of assumptions we want to hold across everything? And this included relatively unconstrained technology availability in state and out of state. So we can build uh, renewable resources in various different places and we can connect to those resources with new transmission, uh, aggressive electrification and efficiency. I think what we've learned from past studies is that is usually the lower cost path to take us to net zero. And so that was a common set of assumptions across all the scenarios here. Uh, we didn't take any measures to reduce service demands. So we're assuming that people in the future are going to be using the same energy services as people today. And that's a conservative assumption. We could do more on the conservation side, but just from a, a conservatism perspective, looking at what we need to invest in to get to a net zero world, where we don't take away any energy services. That's what we assumed here. Um, and then once we'd built that common set, that core case, we explored 23 other future potential worlds. Uh, and so this is asking various different what if questions. And we'll not go into all of those in this presentation, but you can see those in the comprehensive study. Examples are included here. What if lower transmission potential what if lower electrification and transportation? What if gas retained in buildings, et cetera? So that's the setup for how we explored um, the different scenarios. And actually you have all of those questions in front of you in the, in the handout. Um, the way that we model this is to, is to take that future world we've created from all of our assumptions what are the potentials for investing in things? What are the costs for investing in things? What kind of policies do we have in place to, uh, to achieve in the future and constrain the investments that we make? And then we look at this from a economy-wide integrated perspective and optimize the investments in all of the various different energy infrastructure needed to serve our energy demands over time. And 
I'm not expecting you to read all of these uh, different components here, but basically what we're doing is, uh, is developing the infrastructure to give us all of the gasoline, diesel, fuel oil, kerosene, electricity, uh, hydrogen, et cetera, in the economy, how those things uh, play together, interact, and how they potentially lower our costs over time if we can invest in this integrated infrastructure development. Um, and so this comprehensive look across our energy economy, as well as all the linkages between the different sectors, allows us to get to these lowest cost and also realistic solutions for meeting our net zero targets in the future. Okay, so in this presentation, I'll go through a few key themes that come out of the findings. Um, the first is the five pillars, which I think will be familiar to many of you, energy efficiency, clean electricity, clean fuels, capturing carbon. These are our key to achieving our net zero emissions. So I'll go through in, in some detail what we find in those different categories. Siting and permitting will shape the Northwest's new energy map. I think this is one of the biggest uncertainties that we have about how we approach decarbonization in the future. Um, and it's something that we have both control over and will control us. You know, we, we have control over it in that we can develop policy and approaches right now that can facilitate siting and permitting processes. But it's also, there's a great deal of uncertainty about what we can achieve. What are the feasibility limits there? Um, the region is poised to lead in clean fuels development, given the transmission, the, sorry, the emissions constraints in this region, it will be one of the first regions in the country and in the world to develop a large scale uh, clean energy, clean fuels economy. Um, so we'll look at that. Federal funding is boosting nascent clean energy technologies. So what is the impact of IRA and how is it impacting the Northwest? And then finally, reduce tailpipe and smokestack emissions, bring health and economic co-benefits. Okay, so five pillars, energy efficiency, clean electricity, electrification, clean fuels, carbon sequestration. We are halving our energy consumption per person between 2021 and 2050 in our core case. So people are consuming energy more efficiently to provide the same services. Um, clean electricity, so the electricity people are consuming goes from a relatively high carbon content or low for the country, but much higher than we need it to be today to zero in 2050. Electrification, so in 2021, electricity is uh, about a 20% share of total energy consumption by end uses. By the time we get to 2050 in our model, we are about a 90% share. And in electricity or in energy end uses, that's about 60%. So going to electric vehicles, to heat pumps, et cetera. Um, then the remaining fuels in the economy, if you think back to Washington State Energy Strategy, um, what we had found then was that the remaining fuels are decarbonized by biofuels for the most part, because that was the cheapest option. Now IRA has happened and that's kind of changed with the incentives for hydrogen. And so electrofuels become a pretty dominant piece of decarbonizing the remaining fuels for those difficult to decarbonize sectors. And then clean fuels somewhat related to that taking us from a high carbon intensity in 2021 to a much lower intensity in 2050. And then carbon sequestration. So that's a, a key component of our energy economy. Uh, by the time we get to 2050, capturing just over 35 million metric tons of CO2 in the Northwest. Efficiency uh, taking us from 2021 to 2050 we are electrifying uh, different appliances, vehicles, et cetera, as well as shifting to high efficiency technologies. And this get, gets us about 30% reduction in total final energy demand by 2050 in the economy. Uh, so this is pretty significant because if we can shrink the size of the pie that we need to supply with our energy infrastructure, then we can reduce our total costs and the burden of investment in all of these technologies is reduced. At the same time, you see this green bar, which is electricity. 
and electricity is is going way up. So we are we're seeing this shift from a largely fuels based economy today to a uh, electricity based economy in the future. Um, an example of this is in light duty vehicles. You see sales across the top, stocks in the middle, demand at the bottom, and then three scenarios, core, fast transport, and slow transport in the columns. Uh, what we've assumed in sales is this aggressive 100% by 2035 target to get to um, zero emission vehicles, mostly EVs and a sliver of hydrogen vehicles in the yellow. Um, if this is representing when people go to the dealership, what kind of car are they buying? So it means in 2035, anybody who's buying a new car, they're buying an electric vehicle. And that, that gradually filters into stocks over time as people's cars come to the end of their lives, they're replaced. And by 2050, we are almost 100% zero emission vehicles in our core case. In contrast, if you look at slow transport, where we have we've stopped at 50% uh, share of zero emission vehicles. Um, we have about 50% share of zero emission vehicles in 2050 in the stocks. And the, the difference in energy demand is, is marked there. So in the core case, we have this big reduction in energy demand. Uh, in slow transportation, not so much because those electric vehicle motors are much more efficient than ICE uh, vehicles. And so this is one of the ways that we're getting that 30% reduction and lowering our overall costs of decarbonization. Um, electrification is transforming the energy flows in the Northwest. So you see this, this growth in electricity consumption along the bottom, the gray is our end use demand and it's, it's going up 100% over time. Uh, at the same time, we also have growth in other demands for electricity and most notably electrolysis, which we see in Montana in our study. We are co-locating the best wind resources with uh, hydrogen production and fuels production. And you see the, the impact of that on Montana consumption and generation. Um, we, we see this switch in Washington happening where in the beginning we are a, a net exporter of electricity, but by the time we get to 2050, we're a net importer. We have grown our electricity demand significantly and we need to expand transmission and bring power in from other places. Uh, what this looks like from a capacity perspective is, sh is shown here. We see this growth in, in solar and, and wind in Idaho, Oregon, Washington. Um, in Montana, though, we see this growth of 56 gigawatts of wind. And that's, that's really significant. It's where we would want to build the wind if we can build it there, um, because it is the highest cap factor wind. Uh, it's the best bang for the buck, and it also has uh, really nice properties in terms of its shape. It plays well with solar production in the rest of the West, so we get this nice balanced portfolio. But there's questions about feasibility. Can we actually do that? Where can we locate these resources? And it comes down to siting and permitting being one of the biggest questions for uh, expanding our electricity grid and getting to net zero. So we've looked at a variety of cases where this is constrained, transmission is constrained, uh, being able to site and permit new renewables is constrained. And what does that do for us in terms of uh, shifting investment in other places? Um, contrast to previous studies, Oregon sees 1.2 gigawatts of offshore wind here. Past studies showed a lot more. And, and this is because in this study, we're assuming that the 25 gigawatt offshore wind mandate in California gets built. And so it's eating the opportunity for Oregon. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this is not an opportunity for Oregon. None of that wind has got built yet. Um, and so we, we looked at a 10 gigawatt target for Oregon in, in separate analysis to see what that would do uh, for the Oregon economy. And then in Washington, um, we see the, the addition of resources really taking off in 2035 and 2040. And we see this quite even expansion of uh, solar and wind. We also have a lot more 
uh, rooftop solar being built, shown in the, the orange color there. Um, so fuel sector transition to hydrogen and hydrogen derived fuels. The top here is demand, the bottom is supply. So demand is dropping because we are electrifying our economy. We don't have as many fuels. Um, we, those are just remaining in things like shipping and, and aviation in 2050. And at the same time, our supply is getting cleaner. So we're starting in 2021 on the bottom there, 100% fossil fuels, and those gradually shift over to become 100% clean by 2050. Gas is majority hydrogen by 2050. And in liquids, it's, it's Fischer Tropes liquids, basically taking hydrogen from electrolysis and producing drop-in hydrocarbons that can displace those fossil fuels in the economy. Um, as I said earlier, we, we co-site hydrogen production with the best renewable resources. So um, this makes economic sense. You don't want to be uh, producing electricity somewhere else, building a transmission line, bringing the electricity to another location and then using that for hydrogen production. You could have just produced the hydrogen next to uh, the source of electricity. And most of this hydrogen is going to liquid fuels production. And so it also doesn't make sense to be building a pipeline from that hydrogen to another location and then producing liquid fuels. It's cheaper to be transporting liquid fuels places than to be building pipelines because we already have an extensive infrastructure for liquid fuels transport. And so producing hydrogen next to high quality renewables, producing liquid fuels next to that hydrogen production, that is the, the economic uh, option. Although we do end up producing hydrogen in other states as well. And you see that here, hydrogen supply on the bottom, demand on the top. The majority of the hydrogen production is happening in Montana because of that co-siting with high quality resources. But you see there, there is uh, electrolysis happening in other states as well. Um, and that's because locating hydrogen for end use hydrogen consumption. So in vehicles, for, in industry, et cetera. Uh, that is more cost effectively done in many cases where you have the hydrogen production near to those, those end uses. You can avoid building pipelines. Emissions targets, the, uh, the final slide in this section. Uh, what I wanted to point out here was the, the difference across the Northwest. So the, the, the states in the Northwest face very different challenges in terms of emissions reductions. Uh, Washington and Oregon, you can see there starting in 2021 are dominated by oil and natural gas. And so it's predominantly uh, combustion of fuels uh, in industry, in, in households that is driving the emissions. Um, in contrast, Idaho and Montana these are all bright colors on this chart. And that is uh, methane, uh, N2O, and fluorinated gases. And those come from, um, from agriculture in Idaho and Montana predominantly. And it's much harder to reduce those emissions. Reducing emissions in agriculture, there are some measures that you can take, but they are intrinsic to the process. They come from fertilizer, they come from livestock. And so short of getting rid of that agricultural production, it's difficult to reduce those emissions, whereas it's easier to reduce the emissions from combustion because we, we have known methods of, of doing that. We can electrify, we can decarbonize the fuels. Um, and so we see in this case that those states that have this, this large uh, population and uh, industrial activity we can get a lot of the emissions reductions from taking away the oil and natural gas. Uh, we are left over in all states with these non-CO2 emissions. We've taken the measures we, we could take. We didn't get them all the way gone. And so now we need to offset those with uh, changes in land use that increase the land sink um, as well as carbon sequestration. So second theme, siting and permitting, this is the largest uncertainty, I would say, in how we get to net zero in the future. Uh, 
It's going to drive our new energy map, but what that map looks like is really dependent on the work we do now and the uncertainties associated with how much can happen here. Um, so at the simplest level, transmission's role is to take uh, resources from one location to another location so that we can take advantage of geographic diversity and resource diversity. So we get the, the lowest cost portfolio of energy in the future. Um, and this really means in the West, moving high quality Southwest solar to loads and moving high quality Northeast wind to loads. Um, but if we can't get the transmission, then we're reduced in our opportunity to do those two things. And rapid growth of renewable energy, it's really unprecedented. We haven't seen this level of growth and we already see our permitting processes not keeping up with the rates of renewable additions. Um, and so we, in this study, we asked the questions, what if renewables in particular regions can't be developed at the pace expected? What if long distance transmission or pipeline development faces obstacles? And the impact is that it's shifting resource build closer to loads, which puts more pressure on, on those resource permitting processes. So there's no free lunch to be had. If you can't do something one place, you need to do more in another place. Um, and this, this takes us towards coordinated planning across the region. Um, it's going to give us more opportunities for success. And one thing that is different to, uh, for, for today versus 10 years or 20 years ago is that we now know where we're going in the future. You know, planning has been reactive in the past where we have load growth. We think about what kind of resource do we need to build to meet that load growth. Now we know what our emissions need to look like in 27 years from now. And that gives us an advantage in coordinated planning, uh, both across regions and, and thinking about the, the transmission side, what do we need to, to bring resources to load, as well as the renewable side, what kind of resources do we want to build, where and when. And so this is a nice opportunity for us to take advantage of now that can help us uh, lower our costs in the future. Optimal large-scale renewable build-outs in the Northwest presents siting challenges, but also economic opportunities. So we know that it's gonna be difficult to build 56 gigawatts in Montana, for example. Um, but unlike building coal power or gas power, which have uh, local environmental impacts, um, particularly on health outcomes, uh, renewables don't have those health outcomes. They have other impacts on local uh, siting and permitting, but there's the potential for economic opportunities and upsides where we could see large scale investment in renewable hydrogen fuel supply chain infrastructure, all bringing jobs and economic development to a region. Um, transmission is long lead time, long lifetime. So planning needs to start now. If you think about any transmission asset that we build today, that asset is going to see a net zero future for much of its life because it's going to be a 60 year lifetime. And so we should be building our transmission assets for, for that future. Um, and that lends itself to planning integrated energy systems across geographies. You know, we, we can't just put a gas plant wherever we need power. Now we need to think about geographic diversity of resources, the renewable uh, resource availability. And so thinking geographically starts to make sense in a way that it hasn't in the past. And then plan for sector coupling between electricity and fuels. So producing all these clean fuels, particularly in a world that with IRA, we are driving so much hydrogen development. Um, it makes sense to be planning our energy infrastructure into the future to be taking advantage of those opportunities. You know, the electricity sector benefits from having electrolysis because electrolysis is a flexible load and we're moving to inflexible intermittent resources as our supply for energy. And so having this large flexible load helps us balance the system. And we get this win-win situation where we get clean fuels. We also get a balanced electricity grid. Um, and then this is uh, two animal related problems that I think are key to decarbonization of the Northwest. 
So the first is the, the chicken and egg problem. So transmission is required to develop new generation. You know, it's, it's, we can't just develop a wind resource in the middle of nowhere. We need the transmission to be able to interconnect that. Um, but generation is required to justify the investment in that transmission. And so there is this chicken and egg problem, which is somewhat dealt with within a jurisdiction, our planning area itself, where you think about interconnection queues and, and study processes and all of that kind of thing. But when you're looking cross-jurisdictional, thinking about resources in other states that can uh, serve energy needs in load centers, then it becomes a lot more complicated. And so thinking uh, long-term and planning infrastructure that can be there ready for development of resources so that we don't face these, these bottlenecks one way or another is a way to um, address our, our planning challenges going forward. And then the second problem here is the whack-a-mole problem, which it basically is if, if you can't do something one place in the economy, then it puts pressure on things in other parts of the economy. Say you can't build transmission, that puts a lot more pressure on local siting and permitting of new renewables. And so it's important to think about exploring multiple avenues, given the uncertainty in whether we can get transmission sited and permitted, whether we can get renewables sited and permitted, um, rather than giving up early on any of these things, understanding that they're all difficult and we need a lot of, of energy in the future, is important to try and contextualize the scale of this challenge and the scale of the effort needed for, um, for planning for the, for the future. Um, and then siting and permitting challenges are a significant source of uncertainty as we've been talking about, but this boils down to costs and feasibility. So we think about transmission costs over the last decade for large scale transmission, 500 KVs, uh, interties between states, the estimates and the final costs, realized costs, have been very different. It's really hard to know what a transmission line is going to cost up front. Um, but one thing, one positive thing our analysis shows is that even when we push up the costs and investigate cost uncertainties, um, we still build the transmission. So it shows that we're relatively insensitive, at least on some pathways in the Northwest to cost. And so it's really a feasibility challenge. Can we get it built? Because if we can get it built, then we get access to some very valuable resources. Um, and then second is feasibility there, which I think everybody is, is really aware of. There's a lot of complex factors contributing to that. Um, but as I was saying before, limited transmission, it puts stress on these local siting permit and permitting processes. And so if we can pursue transmission and high quality renewables despite uncertainty, then it's going to give us optionality when achieving net zero goals, which basically means we can fail more times before we don't meet our net zero targets in the future. We're not giving ourselves a very brittle solution or system where if we can't get something built, that's it. We, we now don't meet our net zero target. So flexibility and optionality is, is really valuable in achieving our goals in the long term. And then finally, siting and permitting distributed energy resources and load flexibility, that can take some of that pressure off. So if you're facing siting and permitting challenges on the, the grid scale, building uh, more localized renewables and flexible loads can take some of that pressure off the siting and permitting challenge. And so pursuing some of that, it makes sense when we have so much to do and we have to move so quickly in doing it. Clean fuels industry. So Northwest emission targets accelerate development of clean fuel industry to the 2020s. And this is largely due to Washington's emissions target. We start with a very clean electricity sector in Washington, about 80% of our electrons are clean electrons here, um, but we have to meet a 45% reduction in emissions by 2030. And there are a couple of ways of doing that. One is to, um, to electrify all of our current fuel uses in the economy, 
but we don't have time to do that. That's something that we can do over the long term, but it's not something we can do by 2030. Um, another is to capture the carbon, sequester it in the ground and offset emissions, but that's an expensive thing to do. Um, and, and the final one here is to decarbonize the fuels that we're using. Also expensive, but it turns out cheaper than the option of sequestering vast quantities of carbon. Uh, and so that's the strategy that we see in the scenarios in this analysis, where by 2030, we are um, decarbonizing a lot of our liquid fuels use in the economy. And that's coming from, uh, uh, the majority is coming from electrolysis and fuels production from that, that hydrogen. And the, the right-hand side here shows some, uh, some conceptual processes of where electrolysis and hydrogen can go to in the economy. Um, producing clean fuels locally would severely strain the Northwest energy resources. So we're used to thinking about local planning and, and we have many boundaries and, and obstacles to planning more broadly. Um, but clean fuels is one of those things that might just crack that wide open. Because if we try to do that locally, then we would be facing uh, severe costs and difficulties in citing and permitting the resources that we need for that. Um, it's much cheaper to be looking at importing clean fuels from other states. And it lowers the costs by taking advantage of high quality resources and increases the feasibilities, feasibility of, of reaching emissions goals. So again, this is a uh, avoiding the brittle solution, looking for optionality and flexibility in meeting net zero goals. Um, IRA incentives and electrification are major drivers of the clean fuel trajectory. So I think I mentioned before in past analysis, we saw biofuels being really a key feature of a net zero strategy, particularly in Washington. Um, now with IRA and the incentives for hydrogen production, as well as the incentives for carbon capture, we see clean fuels being a, a more cost-effective pathway, clean fuels derived from hydrogen. And so our, our solution is, is uh, much more hydrogen focused than bio, biofuels focused because of IRA. Um, wires and pipelines are competing means of moving clean energy. So, as I was mentioning earlier, you can shift energy by wire, you can build new transmission, and then you could produce clean fuels closer to your loads, um, or you could produce clean fuels further afield and then shift them through liquid fuel transportation networks, through pipelines. Um, and these are really competing ways of moving energy because more and more the lines between electricity and fuels production become blurred. Electricity is and renewables are the source of energy in many cases for, for electricity and fuels. And so how we move that energy, it comes down to a question of, of can we build transmission? What is the cost of the transmission versus pipelines and other ways of transporting it? Um, and so we, our, our networks for moving energy around are becoming much more integrated across different mediums of, of energy. Uh, continued use of fuels requires carbon management in all scenarios. And where we're capturing carbon and producing drop-in hydrocarbon fuels, we need a source of carbon to be able to combine that with. And that's coming from industrial capture. It's also coming from direct air capture and from biomass. And carbon is becoming kind of a commodity in this system. Um, its use is, or its, its capture and its use is a valuable piece of, of the economy. And, uh, and so it's, it's a part of, of thinking about transportation networks of conversion of fuels um, that features pretty heavily in all of our scenarios now. Uh, next theme, nascent technologies and inflation reduction act. The IRA is accelerating adoption of nascent technologies and electric load growth. So in the past, technologies that uh, have included things like nuclear electrolysis, direct air capture, those historically expensive parts of a clean fuels economy, they've shown up in the 2040s in our analysis. But now with IRA and very generous incentives, 
that has been shifted earlier into the 2030s and in some cases earlier than that. Um, the electrolysis to produce hydrogen is cost effective under IRA incentives. So we actually don't need an emissions target to, to get uh, hydrogen from electrolysis. It's now a cost effective thing to do. Um, an IRA accelerates electrification primarily through vehicle incentives. So there's a, the whole slew of, of incentives on the demand side that is going to take us towards electrification in ways that um, previously we were doing with existing local policy. Uh, and so what does this mean for transmission? It means earlier growth of electric loads for end uses and fuels production coupled with greater renewable adoption requires transmission expansion. Um, basically now with IRA, we have a federal set of policies of in, and incentives that take the place of what we were trying to do locally in many cases. And local policy becomes a question of filling in the gaps. What is missing from IRA and uh, what do we need to do to fill those gaps? I'll just skip this slide actually and talk about that. So state and local policies are an opportunity to address those gaps. And what we see as being gaps are first coal power. So there's nothing to shut down coal in IRA. And if we didn't have emissions policy, we would keep on generating coal power moving forward. Um, additional zero carbon electricity deployment. So IRA takes us only so far. We've got PTC and ITC incentives that are economically driving renewable development. We don't need emissions policy. We don't need other local policy to get a lot of renewable adoption, but it rolls off at a certain point. And it also becomes more expensive to develop renewables when you are at much higher penetrations. And so what fills that gap in terms of implementation policy beyond IRA to take us to where we need to be in the 2040s? Uh, same goes for building electrification. So we have incentives in IRA right now that are actually relatively limited in total funding. Um, but what takes us all the way to the targets that we've outlined for 100% um, building electrification, for example. Industrial electrification is something that is relat relatively light in the IRA and is something that uh, we can see significant benefits from doing over time and is a piece of all of our scenarios here. Um, freight truck, zero emission vehicles. Uh, if we're thinking about light duty of vehicles, by the time we get into 2030s, into the th 2030s, it will be economic for people to be uh, buying an electric vehicle when they go to the dealership. But that's not true of freight trucks. And so what kind of policy do we need to be putting in place to uh, help the transition in that area? Aviation, efficiency, electrification, zero carbon fuels, all of these things are not covered in IRA. Same with land sector, reforestation, fire management, ways of increasing the land sink that can give us that offset to the hardest to decarbonize emissions oil and gas methane reductions, and then that last sector, non-CO2, livestock, uh, nitric and adipic acid production, fluorinated gases, all of these things are, as you saw earlier, a large portion of what remains in the 2040s. And how do we address those? That is uh, an area of, of additional work that needs to be done. And then uh, finally, emissions and pollution. So a thing that we, haven't looked at in the past, um, well, we've looked at this part in the past, negative emissions technology adoption is driven by non-CO2 emissions. So we talked about this already. These are the emissions on the um, left-hand side here, sorry, right-hand side um, that we get from agriculture, industrial processes, waste by state in 2022. If we look at what EPA says we can do to reduce these emissions, so the measures they've identified, uh, we could get a 28% reduction in Idaho, a 27% in Oregon, a 37% in Washington, but only a 13% reduction in Montana. So that's doing every measure identified to reduce these emissions. We just get 13% reduction. 
Um, and so we, we require negative emissions technologies to offset those. And those include land sink, geologic sequestration, carbon capture, including direct air capture. Uh, emissions targets required to carbonize fuels, near-term and negative emissions technologies long-term. And you see that in our solutions. We get that, that clean, uh, clean fuels economy in Washington and the broader Northwest by 2030. And then in the long term, we're offsetting those emissions with uh, carbon capture and sequestration. And then finally, pollutant emissions reduction deliver meaningful health benefits. So we haven't calculated this in the past. We now done this for the Northwest. Um, and we see benefits ranging from 2.8 billion a year to 6.2 billion a year in 2030 and 4 billion a year to 8.9 billion a year in 2050. And this is using EPA's COBRA model to calculate what the impact on mortality is, the impact on different health outcomes are. Um, and it comes from reducing fossil fuel plant emissions and vehicle tailpipe emissions. Um, what's left over here is uh, biogenic and wildfire sources of pollutants. They're going to remain and given the, the way that our climate is going right now, those, those, that piece of it could actually increase over time. Um, I will leave it there and open it up to questions and answers. Right, so Ruby has the mic. And she's going to go wherever there's a question. There's got to be a question. Michael has to have a question. Oh, Karen. Hi. Um, thank you for this. Um, I'm just wondering on the IRA um, implementation and looking at how IRA accelerates progress in all these different sectors. What level of assumptions did you make in terms of the success of actually implementing IRA? So how well does the US government and then state governments and then local governments do in actually taking that money, capturing it, using it for its actually intended purpose um, and really getting projects in the ground? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And we, we looked at this from a quite a idealized perspective. So on the demand side where incentives are driving adoption of electric vehicles, for example, that includes some of what you're talking about where there's friction in the system and we're going to be adopting vehicles based on a number of different uh, criteria. And um, those assumptions come from work that was done Princeton repeat study that looked at the impact of IRA. Uh, on the demand side, sorry, on the supply side, IRA basically just lowers the cost of uh, different resources. So we're applying the PTC, we're applying the, the ITC, um, we're applying the incentives for carbon capture, and that just reorders the economics of the various different resources, and we're not uh, capturing any um, uncertainty about whether the, those resources would receive the IRA funding. I think what I would add to this, which may also be an uh, inherent in several questions, is that this is an economic model. It's a least cost model. And so, uh, so far in the presentations that I have been doing, we'll get a variety of questions and particularly, let's say about Montana, for example, and how likely is it that that resource will get built in Montana. And so the, the modeling is not taking into account the politics on the ground or the policy it takes into account existing policy, but it, it doesn't take into account what the human beings are going to do with this information or not do with it. Michael Lazarus, and that was Karen Laughlin of the Stilty Family Foundation who asked the first question, Michael Lazarus, Stockholm Environment Institute. And brilliant job once again, Jeremy, always amazing and comprehensive. Speaking of politics and policy, I can't help but think about what this means for the cap and trade system here in Washington state, right? Prices have just hit the first and second ceilings, heading up to $70. One of the questions on the table 
is should Washington link with California, take the pressure off? Because what I see in your results, similar to what you've had before, is that Washington constraint drives clean fuels into this decade. That's like six or seven years to get all this stuff permitted in Montana, shipping all these clean fuels here to Washington state. So have you thought about how this connects um, to Washington state policy in this regard? And if you say had a linkage to California, it might relax some of these constraints. Yeah, absolutely. The I, something that I didn't mention here, but is something that I would always advocate for if it's possible is to is to take policy over a much broader region. So if you can do regional policy instead of state policy, then it's always going to take your costs down. You can get diversity of resources. Uh, in the, in the case, say you had a Northwest policy, which would be amazing, but probably not on the cards anytime soon. But the emissions that you get from agriculture, for example, those are emissions that are associated with feeding the country, not feeding the state, um, but they are very difficult to reduce. And so a regional policy is, is actually a fairer policy in, in that regard, because you can take those emissions into a a, a broader uh, pool where there are low hanging fruit that could that you could take from other places. Um, and similarly, if you join um, emissions trading with California, then you're also taking from a broader pool of, of options. Um, you know, what else would I say about that? The, the study as it is right now, where we're targeting the emissions reductions for Washington under like this strict like 45 emissions, 45% emission standard. Um, that is assuming that we have implementation policy in place that takes us to that point. And so we are constraining ourselves to 45% emission reduction. How we achieve that is implementation policy, which is the next step beyond this analysis. It's kind of showing us what is the target that we want to achieve and then the next step would be saying, how do we achieve that with incentives, different kinds of, of policy and, the, and carbon uh, trading is, is a mechanism that could be very effective in getting us to that point. Hi, excellent uh, presentation, Nancy Hirsch with the Northwest Energy Coalition. Um, kind of following on Michael's comment, what about uh, power markets in the West? And if we move forward with a fully integrated grid and we have a regional transmission organization, does that change the economics uh, in your planning horizon? <coughs> it changes the economics insofar as it takes us to where we're at in our modeling. We, so we, we do not in include friction associated with uh, uh, balkanized power markets. And so that is a, a set of, of incentives that exist today as to what we might do in terms of different investments that would not be aligned with the types of investments that we see in our modeling. And, and part of that is that we are in essence assuming that there is just one balancing authority for the region. And so it is the, the most... Um, sort of, or the lowest cost way of getting to, to the outcomes that we want. But we know that where we sit today, we can't achieve that with our, our current set of, of incentives. And um, I think that it's, it's well recognized that that is the case. We, we are at the moment not well structured to be able to achieve these outcomes at, at a low cost in the future. But the recon recognition that um, power markets themselves and the organizational structure uh, of our power markets and, um, and our regulatory authorities may not serve us in the, in the long run. Um, and so those are levers to pull themselves. What do those structures look like? What do our power markets look like? Super difficult to change them, but they have been changed. In, in the past, serving us economically. Um, and this is a 
much bigger change to our system than you know deregulation and and so on and so it, it it's very worthwhile thinking about how do those structures need to change what kind of levers do we need to pull to get us to an incentive system that puts the right resources in the right places at the right time I have a, a double question. Uh, did you reflect on the, the cost of critical minerals in, for example, the EV supply chain or in the renewable energy supply chain? And then oh, I'll ask this. So, so it, to answer that question, the only way that we have accounted for that is taking third party forecasts for what um, those minerals would cost translated into the price of batteries. So. Lithium ion costs, for example, in our model come from a blend of ICCT and Bloomberg forecasts that are looking at the availability of the minerals. Um, but beyond that, we haven't done any uh, more analysis. And then the other, the other question is just curious to know what cost range you were contemplating for the negative emissions technologies. And then relatedly, what types of carbon removal you were thinking about, like nature-based versus engineered? <laughs> Yeah, so so the um, the nature based stuff all comes from supply curves of different options for things like reforestation and wetlands protection and so on, and those have costs associated with them that are generally low compared to doing something like direct air capture, um, and so we we select those and those are those are a part of the solution. Those themselves are quite an uncertain piece because we have potentials for them and we, we have these cost estimates. But I think the bigger question is feasibility. Like, can we actually do those because it, um, it intersects with land use and different interests in a way that might be hard to achieve? Um, so there's, a, there's quite a lot of reforestation happening and, and can that actually happen? We, we don't know. Um, on the on the negative emissions technology side, um, then we are we are assuming costs for the various different supply chain components of of carbon capture and sequestration. So uh, development of the sequestration sites, and then the costs of the technologies that can produce the carbon, as well as carbon pipeline investments. The the technologies um, include. Uh, different types of direct air capture, um, and that includes low temperature and high temperature. So the high temperature is powered by nuclear and, and the low temperature electricity. And so those, those costs are all from public sources that are likely not very accurate, um, but I think relatively conservative because we have cost estimates right now for technologies that are kind of on the bench at the moment. And that is an area where a lot of technological development is likely to happen. I think I would add two things on this, um, having ha heard this question many times in the last four years. Um, the, it is better for us to use the public costs than to use the private costs because while the public costs may be undercounting, the private costs may also be too rosy. Um, and secondly, also when Jeremy says we select, I think he means the model, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's not like Jeremy is selecting each of these along the way. The model selects based on the cost. He's one with his model. <laughs> <laughs> um, one more question. Uh, I often hear from some who say that the hydrogen green hydrogen that we produce is going to be used at its highest use for replacing fossil generated hydrogen and that it will be used for plastics production primarily and fertilizers and not used as a replacement for carbon-based fuels in our industrial sector or maritime or aviation that that won't compete with the need to use the green hydrogen. So if you assumed that, how would that change your, your outcomes, I guess? Or do you not believe that? I mean, I, I, it's a question on 
whether you think the econ how the economics are going to shape up as the hydrogen market develops. Yeah, so I, I don't believe that in, in a world that is emissions constrained. So if we are if we're in another state that doesn't have an emissions constraint, then we likely would do some of that under the IRA because it's a little bit of a money printer where you can produce the hydrogen with an incredible incentive and then uh, and then put it into a, a power plant, burn that hydrogen, produce electricity, because you don't actually need to have a very valuable off-taker for hydrogen under the current IRA incentives. And in that system, it's basically you just put a resistor in there to make it less efficient. Um, in a world that is emissions constrained, then it's a different story because you want to get inefficiencies out of the system um, because anything that contributes to any sort of emissions increases is going to is going to be less economic than otherwise. And the things that you can do with hydrogen in an emissions constrained world that are most valuable are displacing the most expensive fuels. So uh, SAF is a good example of that, that it's expensive, it's required. And if you can displace it with a fuel derived from hydrogen, then that is a really high value off taker. So you already received your incentive now you sold it for a lot of money and that's high value. Same with um, is. sustainable aviation fuels. Um, and uh, it's the same with, with displacing gasoline diesel as well. Those are expensive products. And if you can avoid investing in uh, gasoline and diesel in a emissions constrained world, then it's high value for the use of hydrogen. So we have the option of hydrogen going into the gas pipeline and being burned. Um, and it's not happening in this model because of the emissions constraint. It's much more valuable to be using that hydrogen and hydrogen derived products to be decarbonizing sectors of the economy where the alternative is really expensive. And so as a hydrogen producer, you have some nice opportunities right now. Um, particularly in SAF, you could be making a lot of money. Um, since we're on 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 that question, um, yeah, I'm I'm kind of sitting in the. Okay, let's. You identify yourself? Oh sure, I'm Brad Liliaquist with McKinstry. Um, I guess I'm just trying to get into the granularity of this exact topic. So like the way I typically would think about it is um, with the pre IRA math that, you know, electrification, the things that you want to electrify are EVs, buildings. Um, are you saying that with the IRA math on hydrogen, that even those sorts of uses might actually start to tip towards hydrogen? Uh, based solutions? No, it's, so there, there's two factors to the answer to that. One is that uh, there are a lot of things that are very cost effective to electrify right now. And EVs is one of those things, particularly, you know, that point that we pass in terms of the, the vehicle costs um, versus ICEs, that's coming in the next few years where regardless of incentives, you'd want to be doing that. And so um, that's, you know, there's, there isn't an argument to be retaining ICEs and then producing hydrogen derived fuels. The other thing is that um, the, uh, the amount of fuel in the economy in the 2030s is still enormous. Uh, and we have to remember that it is, not, it is not the price of, of clean fuel, the one that's under IRA. That is the price after we've received this incentive from the federal government. And if we start, you know, if, if we consider the hydrogen market right now and we're paying IRA incentives for, you know, 10 million metric tons of, of hydrogen, then it's a, it's a few billion dollars in incentives 
if it's cost effective to be displacing fuels in the economy, then that is now hundreds of billions of dollars of incentives paid out under IRA. And so there is a limit to this that uh, we would not see that level of, of hydrogen uh, deployment in, in fuels um, displacement. Hi, uh, Annabelle Drayton with the Northwest Energy Coalition. Um, I have a really quick question and then a second question. Um, does the model assume any amount of uh, vehicle miles traveled reduction for transportation? No. Um, it is something that we talked about at the beginning of the study, and we did do a scenario in the Washington State Energy Strategy that looked at that. Um, it would be desirable to do something like that. Um, but from a conservatism perspective, in this analysis, we were just looking at what if everybody used energy services like they do today and in, in the future. Um, there's many opportunities for conserve, conservation that would be really valuable. It's, it's difficult for us to model because the costs of achieving those are relatively unknown because it's things like uh, different zoning or development of public transport, or, or new uh, types of building construction, things like that, that the costs are unknown, the benefits would be large, and we could run models to tell us what the benefits are that would sort of cap what we want to invest in those kind of things. But in general, there are many opportunities, and we, we just haven't represented them. Thank you. And then my kind of follow-up question, which is really separate, um, was on, uh, for liquid fuels, I, I, if I recall correctly, you mentioned that it's more cost effective to import liquid fuels um, into the region. And I'm, I'm curious if the model, um, if there are any, if there's any measurable increase in liquid fuel production in the Northwest. And I specifically asked that question because Washington's clean fuels program requires an increase in liquid fuel production in Washington in order to continue reducing the carbon intensity trajectory. And so I'm just curious if the model identifies any cost-effective liquid fuels production in Washington and the Northwest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we modeled the clean fuels requirement in the Washington uh, fuel mix, as well as in Oregon as well. And it was, it was basically superseded by the electric vehicle um, requirement because that gives you like a credit that goes towards it. And so we, um, we ended up not being binding in the 2030s on that side because we had so many electric vehicles getting adopted. Uh, the, there is clean fuels production happening though in Washington in small amounts. And there's a lot of clean fuels happening, uh, production happening in the Northwest, primarily in Montana. And so there's maybe 50%, 40 to 50% of the clean fuels demand uh, for the region happening in the Northwest, and then the rest is being imported from somewhere else. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christine Grant. I'm with the Whatcom County Public Utility District. Um, and I just had a question about how the model uh, analyzed geothermal potential in the Pacific Northwest? So the answer to that is it did not. So we had, um, we had geothermal potential in California, but we didn't represent geothermal potential in the Northwest. Um, that is something that is, if there, if there are opportunities to do it, then it may well be a, a valuable piece of a future resource portfolio, and it would be displacing some of the other investments that we made. In general, and you would know more about it than me, but we have quite limited potential where we, where we do have it in the rest of the West because they are super or very site specific. Um, but that is something that if there are opportunities that we haven't captured that we could include in, in future modeling. <laughs> 
and Laura, and then I think we get for one dear order. Okay, I'll go fast. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. My name is Kate Bruns with Renewable Northwest. Um, I was curious about a more general question about the model, how least cost was defined or most technically efficient. Um, I was curious if that included the cost of environmental impacts when, with clean energy siting or whether that included um, cost of impact to human health and human life, social cost of greenhouse gases, anything along those lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the so the the way that those things were incorporated, well, the first thing that you said, the 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 costs associated with the with environmental impacts, is uh, through scenarios. So it was really, can you invest in this, or are there other factors that are pushing back on it, such that you can't get these resources cited and perpetrated? Um, and so that it shows up in those scenarios where we're limited in what we can build because there are these other factors that prevent us from, from getting new transmission or getting uh, new renewable resources. Um, on the second one, and back on the first one, the reason why we did it that way and not try and incorporate some costs associated with that for each project, it's because we didn't know what those costs would, would be. And it's really hard to know until you've actually done a very site-specific study to know what costs associated with a project look like. Um, on the second one, we didn't, we didn't use reduction in health outcome or, in, or improvement in health outcomes as a, a criteria for optimizing. So the, the costs of, um, or the benefits of of those health outcomes weren't in the objective function of the model. Instead, we just looked at after the fact, calculating what are the, um, the health benefits of doing these kind of emissions reductions. And if we were to uh, include that in the objective function, then we may get a few more improvements, but really not very many because we are already doing a lot to reduce the sources of particulate matter and other emissions just in the process of going to net zero. So we're taking away tailpipe emissions, we're taking away point sources of emissions from power generation, which are the two largest uh, contributors. And what we're left with is, is pretty much just the background that exists already. Um, and so I don't think that it's, it's something that we need to do to, to reduce um, the impacts on health more, but it is something to be aware of that actually the most benefits would come from things that are uh, on a smaller scale than what we've looked at. So we're looking at state level, but the, the real impactful areas are places that are proximity to roads, and proximity to other sources of emissions that we're not picking up. And we could do so much better if, if planning in those areas prevented exposure to those kind of pollutants. Uh, Maura Brugger, I'm with CLC Light. Um, great presentation, a little bit overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. On the distributed energy resource side, and actually on the distribution system, I was a little surprised to see no mention of microgrids, automated distribution management systems, sort of ADMS, DERMs, things that we're looking at, mm -hmm. um, so in vehicle to grid. So I'm kind of wondering, is that just sort of, is, is your distributed energy resources a placeholder for all of those potential technologies that we're seeing being developed that allow us to better use the resources we always already have, as well as the potential future of these, you know, we, we, we have some fairly macro um, electrification loads coming at the port, King County Metro yeah. Transit and others. And so just wondering where that fits into to this. Yeah, so the, the way that we modeled our distributed energy resources was um, putting in rooftop solar, putting in distributed batteries um, and also flexible loads. And you're talking about vehicle to grid um, on the flexible load side, we assumed that in our core case, that 10% of heating loads in residential and commercial would participate in, um, in flexible load or, or uh, load response. 
and they could shift backwards or forwards by an hour. So thermal inertia would allow us a little bit of shift there, but not very much, because if you think about the hottest days of the year, or the coldest days of the year, people are likely not to be turning off their air conditioner for more than a couple of hours. Um, and then on the vehicle side, we assume 75% of vehicles would, would participate in uh, grid to vehicle smart charging. So shifting up to eight hours backwards into the evening and allowing for smart charging that prevented vehicles from really increasing peak loads very much because we sort of backfilled around peak. Um, and then in our high DER scenario, we assumed vehicle to grid as well. Um, as well as increased participation of heating loads. And um, we found that <clears throat> the benefits of doing nothing versus doing what's in our core case were significant. It was two or three billion a year to be, be able to participate in those ways. Um, we went from core case to that high case where we were doing vehicle to grid and we still got benefits, but not as much. So it's sort of diminishing returns on going further and further on the DER side or DR side. Um, the other things you mentioned, uh, including the um, <clears throat> localized grids, we, we don't really have a way of incorporating that into our model. So the, the big benefits of, of reliability are something that we're kind of like taking for granted in our model that we will serve the loads reliably. Um, but those are all things that are happening kind of below that, that level that we get to and are important. Um, and when we, when we work with utilities, then we have a lot of utility data that we can use to be more specific and, and look at those kind of questions. But when we're looking at public level data, then we can't really take it all the way to that level. All right. <laughs> I think it's definitely time for some food and drink. As Jeremy mentioned, uh, the, he barely scratched the surface and as more unnoted, <laughs> It's already complicated there. However, we invite you to net zero northwest nznw.org, where we attempted to um, do the best we could to explain these results in a variety of different ways for you to be able to take them in. Um, we'd love for you to take the survey by using the QR code. code. We'll leave it up for 10 minutes. The last two conferences I've been at, they've left it up for three seconds and <laughs> I don't think they got too many uh, results, but we're gonna leave it up. Please feel free to take it. It's a short survey, but it helps us with our work. And with that, uh, thank you all very much for coming, for your excellent questions and a huge thanks to Katie and Jeremy, without whom we would not have had this event. Thank you all very much. <laughs>